It is a beautiful night for baseball and a big weekend at Great American Ballpark. That's right. Turning back the clock as we celebrate the 1990 World Championship Reds. And the 2015 Reds are wearing those throwback jerseys, as are the Cubbies tonight in the first of three from Great American Ballpark. Hi again, everybody, alongside the Cowboy, Jeff Brantley and Jim Day. I'm Tom Brenneman. Welcome, as always, to Reds baseball. What a weekend. We're excited about it. It's amazing. Only a little more than a week has gone by since we saw the Cubs. But my, oh, my, have they made significant changes in less than 10 days. Yeah, they have, Tom. We've heard about the prospects. Yes. And now we're starting to see them. We saw Jorge Soler. Now Chris Bryant. Much anticipated. He has not been just a star. He has been the star everywhere that he has been. Offensive powerhouse yet to hit his first major league home run. Let's hope it doesn't happen here. Also, Addison Russell. This kid is a shortstop coming up. 21 years of age, played five games at second base, and now he is in the big leagues playing second base for the Cubs. What kind of athlete is this guy? Phenomenal. He was the number one prospect in all of baseball, came over in the Jeff Samarja deal from Oakland last year. The guy trying to get them out and the rest of this Cub lineup was mighty good, even in a losing effort on Sunday night in St. Louis, and that's Mike Leake. Mike Leake threw the ball awfully well, Tom, in St. Louis. He made an adjustment getting the ball down in the strike zone. I think that was the big key for Leake. The first few batters of the game, the ball was elevated, and then all of a sudden, we saw the old Mike Leake down in the zone, throwing strikes, getting outs in rapid fashion. The Reds just weren't able to get him any runs. Meanwhile, it's a first road start for the big high price free agent star formerly a boss in a little while with Oakland but he is winless and not pitching well and that's John Lester he's throwing the ball harder he hit 94 in his last start but velocity is not winning ball games you see those numbers right there that's not what the Cubs signed him to do the Red scored six runs off Lester in a no decision in a matchup with Lee at Wrigley Field a week ago a big weekend. Jim Day will have more on it, including some of those from a 1990 World Championship team.
After a fairly successful road trip in St. Louis and Milwaukee, the boys are home tonight and the weather not nearly as cold as it has been. Yeah, there's some cloud cover out there. 60 degrees first pitch, headed home about 55 degrees. Now, if you're headed to the ball game on Saturday, you better bring some sort of rain gear because there's a very good chance of rain around that 110 start time. Sunday does look a little bit better. Uh, how about those long balls in Milwaukee, huh? Huh? That Todd Frazier smack? Woo! Oh! A little early on the sound effect, but I'll take it. Enjoy the game, everybody, on Fox Sports Ohio. Tim, thank you very much. I'm Jim Day on the field, and as I said in the pregame show, there's just an extra buzz in the air. The 25th reunion, 25th anniversary of the 1990 World Championship team. We heard from some of those members on the pregame show. Let's hear from the guy that used to throw triple digits like a roll to Chapman, Rob Dibble. I, I think every year you don't win a championship is a failure. And I, I think to be remembered now that, that we did something so successful that, you know, go, goes down in history as, as one of the greatest years, wire to wire. And then we've never lost a game in the World Series. So I'm probably the most proud of that is that you don't look back 25 years and go, oh, I gave up that game winning home run. So, yeah, it, it, nothing beats winning the World Series. And after tonight's game before the fireworks, they will be introduced on this field, and you won't miss a moment of it. We'll bring it to you live on Reds Live, the post-game edition. So stay tuned for that. But first, another NL Central showdown. Reds owe the Cubbies one. We're back with the play-by-play -play action with Tom and the Cowboy after this. Opening game of a six-game homestand. It starts with the first of three against first-year Cub manager Joe Madden and his Chicago Cubs. Spent time with the Angels and, of course, nine years manager of the Rays and now with the Cubs. In his lineup tonight, brought to you by Lexus. Dexter Fowler in center, Jorge Soler and right Anthony Rizzo at first. Our first look at Bryant, the phenom third baseman. Coglin in left field, Castro at short. Veteran David Ross, former red behind the plate. John Lester bats eight. Joe Madden's done that every game as manager in the National League. And Addison Russell, another highly touted youngster, bats ninth, plays second base, and they'll be facing Mike Leake. 
Luke threw the ball, as we said, very well against the Cardinals in his last start, and he has always thrown the ball well against the Cubs in this ballpark. His home the park. right one, says Jeff Nelson, our home plate umpire. We are underway, 62 degrees, so a lot cooler than when we left Cincinnati to embark on that three-city, 10-game, 11-day road trip. Leaks 7 and 0 in this ballpark. 5 and 0 is his record. 7 and 0 the team is record. It's got to give you a little comfort. So many offseason acquisitions made by the Cubs, and the man at the plate, one of them, Fowler, and that strike three called a dandy on the inside corner. Mike Leak, our IGS, bringing the energy indeed in his career against the Cubs at Great American Ballpark. The team is 7 0. He is 5 0, allowing two runs per nine innings. And that gives you a mental advantage before the ball game ever starts. When you're comfortable against your opponent before you ever take them out. Or hey, so Lair, it's funny, you know, we're talking about Bryant tonight and Russell tonight because they've been brought up in the last week. This is a young man who who is a number one guy in their organization. They just brought him up in September. Fly ball right center and that takes care of Solaire. Well, Solaire is only 23 years of age as well. The Reds on defense presented by Ford. Hamilton flanked by Bird and Bruce. Frazier back in there after an off day yesterday. Likewise for Pena. And the regular cast, Cozart, Phillips, and Votto round out the infield. And here comes Anthony Rizzo. You know, it's interesting. You look at, at all these prospects of the Cubs, and you still have to include Rizzo because he's still so young, as is Castro. All of them are under 26. I totally agree. But it's interesting. Castro is a homegrown talent. Solaire is homegrown. Russell is not. Bryant is. Rizzo is not. But when you're trying to build up your team and your system and you trade away veteran players, these are the kind of guys you better bring in. Well, you get a guy like Anthony Rizzo at a younger age, very similar to Castro and Addison Russell from other clubs. You want them to play together and play well and gel. A very nifty start for Mr. Leak. One, two, three. Reds coming up when we return. Close to CincinnatiUSA.com. By Chevy, check out their award winning lineup. Only at your tri state Chevy dealer. And by Skyline Chili. I get a little bit of that today. Feeling good. It's Skyline time. Oh, yeah. Red starting lineup presented by Meyer. 
Billy Hamilton to lead it off, followed by Joey Votto and Todd Frazier. Phillips, Bruce, Bird in the middle. Bird homered yesterday for the first time as a red. Pena, Cozart leaked the latter third. Hamilton did not get a chance to play against Lester in Chicago, and boy, would we love to see the effect he has on Lester if he can get a ball. For those of you that were not with us, we documented that Lester clearly has a case of the yips. Throwing the ball to first base when a runner is on. You see his first three starts as a Cub without a win, very high ERA. I mean, it has been a miserable beginning for Lester. 15 and two-thirds innings. The league is hitting 353 against him. And in 15 innings, he has allowed 12 earned runs, six of those against the Reds in the start last week. Two on Billy Hamilton. Well, the key pitch for Lester is that last pitch that he threw to Hamilton, the cut fastball. He'll use it on both sides of the plate. Now he'll use other pitches as well, but that pitch has to be on for him to be successful. And right back into center and right from the start, we are going to get a look at this such, it's such an intriguing, fascinating situation. Lester, for the first time in years, Threw to first base. He threw the first one high. The second one he threw 20 feet from Rizzo. I mean, we're talking area code violation there. And now he is facing the number one base dealer. That was Zach Cozart at first. This is the number one base dealer in the major leagues. Hamilton thrown out for the first time all year. First time a red has been thrown out all year yesterday in Milwaukee. And there he goes. Pitch taken and not even bothering to throw is Ross. If the Reds get people on base tonight, they have a chance to score a pile of runs because they're going to run all night. Here's what the Reds should do. As soon as Lester picks his knee up, you can see Hamilton is running on first move. Even if Lester decides to throw the ball to first, it's going to be such a rainbow throw that whoever is stealing, it could be anybody. They're going to make it, even if it was Brian Pena. That way, Rizzo has to get the ball. He's got to hurry to make a throw. You may end up at third base. Castro, the shortstop, right behind Billy, who has a huge lead out there. And he started two and stopped. 2-0 two oh now on Joey Votto. Don't be surprised if... On the next pitch or two, Hamilton darts for third. Well, Lester will step off, but he is not going to turn and spin and fire the ball to second base. That one gets away, and Hamilton can jog down to third. Now, folks, I'm not a mind reader, and I don't know what John Lester's thinking about. But when you get Billy Hamilton on first and he steals with that kind of ease, he almost took third on the first pitch. This pitch is a direct result of that in my mind. Well, now a scoring chance right from the get-go. Hamilton a single, a stolen base, goes to third on a wild pitch, 3-0 to Votto. And he takes a strike. Joey has had an incredible start, as many of you know. Healthy again. 22 hits and 61 at bats. Six home runs, which leads the league at 14 runs batted in. And Hamilton catching the attention of Lester. As if he was going to steal home. I think it's obvious after seeing Lester in Chicago, the Reds plan on trying to get as far in his head on the base pass as they can. Strike two, that's two pitches in a row. Votto was not so sure. Full count. Watch the reaction of Votto. This ball is outside. Now, when Votto turns back the entire time, he is talking with his head in the ground, and he is speaking directly to Jeff Nelson, the home plate umpire. Bouncing ball will bring in a run. Castro throws out Votto, and just like that, the impact 
of speed produces an easy red run. This is what we've seen Votto do from day one. Whatever it takes, put the ball in play, get the runners moving, or get them home, or drive them in with a long ball. Well, you can make this first inning a very, very long one if you can now get another guy immediately on base and get Lester thinking again. They spent a King's ransom to bring in Lester, 31 years old, has had a dynamite career primarily, almost exclusively, until last year with Boston. Helped pitch them to a World Series, and he was as big a reason as anybody they had on that team why they won it. But last year they dealt him to Oakland. And Oakland brought him in to get him to the World Series. Lester lost the decisive game with a big lead against Kansas City in a one game playoff. And let's remember Kansas City was off to the races on the base pass as well, even when they were behind. Oh, that one got a piece of Jim Riggleman. Jimmy moves pretty well now, but he's in good shape. That was a heat seeker. Two and two on Frazier. And it's three balls and two strikes. Todd a day off yesterday. Four home runs, 13 runs batted in. Phillips waits on deck. Is a fair ball into the corner. And Frazier will coast into second base with a double. This looks like that cutter we were talking about earlier, Tom, and the ball stays up. It was not a conventional power swing by Frazier. As you can see him lunge for the baseball, a backdoor cutter, and he hooks it down the left field line. Frazier stole 20 bases a season ago. He has won so far this year. And look, with all of Lester's problems, and, and we've talked a little bit about him, we'll talk more about him as far as his inability with confidence to throw the ball to a base in a pickoff attempt. It doesn't mean the Reds are just going to run everybody on their team every time somebody gets on base. I mean, you've got a runner in second, one out in the inning in the heart of your order coming up. Maybe Frazier doesn't run. And again, maybe he does. Well, I think the the object here for the Reds is to continue to make John Lester think that they will run. Brandon has been solid with the bat the early part of this year. Without a home run, in fact, he doesn't have an extra base hit. Frazier dancing around. And it looked like Brandon went too far. He did. Well, where the Reds have benefited with Brandon Phillips is when they took him out of the seventh spot. Things were not going real well in that spot for Brandon. They put him in the number four spot. He has hit the ball with a lot more consistency. And he's hit the ball on the nose a heck of a lot more in that spot. Maybe it's just the responsibility or maybe it's the position he's in right now. Clearly, Reds are unhappy with the strike zone of home plate umpire Jeff Nelson. You saw Votto twice, and now strike three called on Brandon. You can see where David Ross is setting up behind the plate, and David Ross, the former Red, catches Lester every time out. He puts a portion of his mitt on the plate, and then about three-quarters of the mitt off the plate. Now that ball hit in the heel of the glove. It looks like it's still a strike. Now Jay Bruce. Under in second one in two out. Yeah. Same pitch there. Bruce's batting average is slipped down to 179. 10 of 56. He does have three home runs. Nine batted in. Four of those on a grand slam. Boy, 
Reds are hoping this homestand will ignite Bruce and Bird more than the first homestand. Harlan had the home run his first as a Red in the game yesterday. Foul territory, and that's out of play. One and two to Jay. Well, Jay really pulled off of that pitch there. Anytime that your front shoulder is coming out, your hands have a tendency to drop and drag through the strike zone. You hear that term? He's getting around the ball, but a lot of times that's where Jay's at. Front hit opens, front shoulder opens, back drags through the zone. One ball, two strike pitch, two outs with Frazier leading in scoring position. Struck him out on a high fastball to end the inning. But the Reds get a run, a couple of hits. And at the end of one, they lead Lester and the Cubs, 1-0. on grandpa and they've got the smiles going too. <laughs> look at those curls so you still have them <laughs> whatever <laughs> all right now we get a look for the first time at chris bryant and what a start bryant is off to there was all the debate in spring training where he had more home runs than any player in arizona or florida he was arguably the best offensive player on any team in spring training in either location, Grapefruit League, Cactus League. As some of you may know, the argument was made that if the Cubs waited two weeks to bring him to the major leagues, roughly two weeks, that they would have control over Bryant for one additional year before he could become a free agent. So you got both sides of people saying, how in the world would the Cubs be worried about that instead of having a guy like this on the big league team? And his bat just went flying into the stands and it hit a gentleman right in the side of the head. When you watch Bryant with the bat, you'll know why that bat flies out sometimes when he swings. He sets up at the plate. That bottom hand is all the way underneath the bat. He's got his pinky finger all the way under. See that knob of the bat is right in that area. You can see how far even the hand here on the very end of the bat. So you're really only holding the bat with three fingers. Straight up in the air is a 10 to the fan right behind the Cub dugout. He looks like he's going to be all right, by the way. 
He uh, is walking around on his own. The medical people are coming down to make sure, but good Lord willing, he's going to be okay. That bat comes flying. Scary stuff. It looked like he jumped up to try to step in front of a couple of kids that are sitting down there. You know, with all the talk of all these prospects, the one guy who was the most impressive cut when we saw them during that series last week was this guy right here, Chris Coughlin, former National League Rookie of the Year, in the driver's seat, brought to you by Kia. How about those numbers against Mike Leak? Eight for eight. <laughs> kind of hard to get any better than that. It's an awfully good fastball hitter. And he squares up the ball that is running away from him, and that's leak strength. That's why we've seen right away breaking balls and change ups, trying to keep him off speed. One ball and two strikes on Chris Cotton. Reds dropped two out of three in that series last week. They should have won two out of three. They had the one game get away from them where they got away late. Broke it back, pop up, short right, Jay there. And how about that? Mike Leak says, for the first time, take that, Mr. Cockman. Well, he pitched him in a totally different manner in that and that. He pitched him backwards. Slow early, came hard in with two strikes, and then he came back in there with a cutter and got it in on his hands. Slow down the eyes and then speed up the fastball. Now Starlin Castro with two down and nobody on Castro perhaps the hottest cubby of them all a batting average at 355 two home runs and a team best 11 runs batted in comes a bit Castro since he came to the major leagues at the top of their batting order but perhaps has now arrived at a point in his career. But they're going to give him a chance to start driving in runs, and he's doing it so far. So much talk about what position is in the future for this kid. Will it always be shortstop? He made a lot of errors there. Would it be left field? He's got power. He hits with consistency. There are a lot of folks that will tell you right now that Addison Russell is a better defensive shortstop than Starlin Castro is right now. But Castro's a veteran, that it's not the time to make that move, evidently. It's a wintertime move. Where you talk to the players and you let them know we're coming to spring training, this is what we're going to do. The last thing that you want is for a defensive position move to upset this guy's rhythm at the plate because he can hit. Well, so far, it's all about Mike Lee. Six up, six down. Reds right back to the back, leading one nothing.
Goodwin, Fowler, Soler in the outfield, and the youth along the infield. Where they have Bryant, Castro in there tonight. We have Russell and Rizzo. And look at the ages. The two veterans are 25. And they're veterans. They've been around a while. But they're they're not at the age where they're ancient compared to a Chris Bryant or an Addison Russell or a Jorge Soler. Here's Marlon Byrd. And that one was shot into right field. And maybe we're starting to see for the first time some solid at bats being put together by Birdie and that line drive to second his first time up yesterday he had a two run home run and now this backdoor cutter gets right over the heart of the plate and Bird barrels this one up yeah the home run that he had yesterday kind of right of dead center but it was not a pull home run not something that he pulled off of he stayed on the baseball as he did there Bird has never been a base dealer. It's as simple as that. Only one year in his career did he have double figures, and that was his first full season in the major leagues in 2003. He had 11. Well, he may not be a base dealer, but he has showed some phenomenal defensive prowess out in left field here in the early going with a red uniform. After the last half inning when Lester was on the mound and the Cubs came in to hit their manager Joe Madden came out and spent the entire time in between innings talking with home plate umpire Jeff Nelson. We have no idea what it was about as Pena after showing bunt looks at two in a row and you saw a generous strike zone in that first inning for Lester on the mound and Pena didn't like this one. That's that cut fastball starts off the plate. It looks just like a fastball from release point of Lester and then it cuts right back to the corner. Cozart back in the A spot. He hit number two yesterday and one hit in four at bats ball one. Now he has come out of the gate smoking. If it was not for how hot Joey Votto has been, this is the guy that we would be talking about. That's how good he's swinging the bat. Not just singles, he's in the ball out of the ballpark. Yeah, four home runs, and that matches his total from all of last year. He also has four doubles. One nothing Reds, one on, one out, one ball, one strike. And that's off the outside corner, two and one on Kozo. Almost see the game plan of Lester. He'll throw that four seamer as he did on the previous pitch, just off the edge, away from Kozar, and then he'll come back with that cut fastball, start it in the same spot, and bring it back to the outside corner. Numbers this time last year for Kozar. 147 the batting average. He would end up in the very low 220s overall in the year. Seemed like in the start that Lester had, I think it was against San Diego his last time out. Every time they got a runner on base, they were off to the races. And it didn't matter who it was. Well, Bird has an enormous lead, as if to entice him to think about throwing over, which he does not. And it's fouled back out of play, and we're still at two and two. But I still hearken back to what we were talking about earlier. Marlon Bird may not be a base stealer, 
But I guarantee you, if he takes that lead he just had there and he breaks on first move from Lester, they're not going to get it. If Lester throws the ball to first, he's going to be safe by the time Rizzo gets the ball. And he's got a pretty good chance to beat David Ross, even though Ross has a quick pop time from catch release. Four strikeouts in the game now by Lester. And here comes Mike Leak. It is surprising during that entire at bat of Pena and Kozar that we have not seen Bird run. Is not a pitcher in the league, certainly a left handed pitcher, but really any pitcher. If any runner takes the kind of lead Bird is taking right now, he'd pick him off or certainly attempt to. There is no way that two at bats would go by without a throw over to first base. Now, there have been a lot of great pitchers over the years that maybe didn't have the yips like Lester clearly has. Most of them are power pitchers, hard throwers. Dwight Gooden comes to mind, although Greg Maddox was not a power pitcher. And you can run Maddox out of the gym if you got on base. The problem that you have as a base runner, even though the scouting report and the video tells you Lester can't throw the ball to first, when you get out there at the cut of the grass, your instinct tells you, I am out here in no man's land. What am I doing here? Popped up. It'll back up Rizzo. And the inning is over. Reds get a leadoff single, and he stays put over there. End of two. Reds lead 1-0. Dollars. It includes a hot dog, a bag of wheat thins, a 16 ounce Coke, and during this homestand, mini Oreos. How are you going to beat it? Nine bucks for all that. During this homestand, the Kroger meal deal. Day game tomorrow. Tickets are available for Sunday. 1.10 the start time both days. And then we have night games Monday and Tuesday with Milwaukee in, tw in town and a 12:35 game Wednesday to finish off the homestand. So how long is that Kroger meal deal going on with the Oreo? 
because I know I'm going to get a call. Daddy, can I get some of those things? Because he loves the Oreos. Oreos just he loves Oreos. This home stand. You tell about our main man, Mason. Mason loves Oreos. Who doesn't love Oreos? I Back like them the in my eyes. I mean, who cream. doesn't love Oreos? Ross taken care of on the hot comeback <laughs> into the man. He actually likes the double and triple stuff. Sure. Oreos. But I, I like them in the ice cream. Because, you know, the debate isn't whether you like Oreos. The debate how is you like them. how do you eat them? You know, do you, do you take it apart? Do you eat all the, the, the icing in the middle and then get to the cookies? Or do you just wolf it all day? Well, the, the part that I don't understand is taking a cookie and letting it sit in the milk and get soggy and then eat it. That, that doesn't go for me. Okay. Now, I can eat them. But I want ice cream with it. And if I'm going to drink something, it's after I'm already done. Gotcha. Now, do you dip ribs in milk? <laughs> Not hardly. Okay. I dip them on my tongue. <laughs> Joe Madden comes over to the National League. And every game so far, he's done what we're seeing here tonight. And that is that the pitcher. In the A spot. Saw Tony LaRusso do that. We've seen others do it. Where, in essence, after the pitcher, you have a second leadoff man. And Walt Weiss is doing the same thing in Colorado right now. You know, Tony LaRusso used to say, well, if we could get, you know, the nine guy on, the leadoff guy, the two guy, then I've got Albert Pools and the bases are loaded. It's on the inside corner. Lester gone looking. Well, I tell you, Lester, we don't know what Lester is saying to the home plate umpire, and we don't know the conversation between Joe Madden and the home plate umpire, but it certainly appears like there's a lot of whining going on. Now, the Reds have been unhappy with the strike zone, but in between innings, it, it, it Madden was out there, and, and then the last half inning, Lester had a, a somewhat lengthy debate as he was heading back to the dugout. There is as much manipulation of the umpire at home plate as there is with the curveball slider and change up on the mound. Whether it be from the dugout, whether it be from the hitters that come to the plate. Everybody's trying to get that last little inch because if you can get sure. that. Your success rate increases dramatically. And that's good morning, good afternoon, and good night for Mr. Russell. Nine up, nine down for Mike Lee. Top of the order coming up. Reds lead one nothing. During his career, depending on when the season starts, March and April, this is his career, and it's been a good one, and it's been a long one. 
And you see, notoriously a slow starter. Look at those numbers after. And that's pitching in the American League. And we know that when he came out of, well, really not coming out of spring training, during spring training, suffering from the dead arm phase for quite a, quite a while. As a matter of fact, there went about two weeks there where he did not pitch to competi competitively to hitters. He was throwing simulated side sessions. Sinking liner, it'll fall in front of Fowler, and here we go again. Sound the trumpets. Billy, two out of two. And even though, Cowboy, you love to quote, throw in the heater, Ricky. A line that could easily be substituted is run, Billy, run. Run, Billy, run. Just start walking off the back, and as soon as he gets his sign, just take off. What are they going to do? He's not going to run to second and beat him. I think Hamilton can beat him. If he took off from the mound to second, Hamilton would beat him there from first base. He's got a huge lead. Got his luster throw over there. No, not on the first pitch. Billy not running. Strike one to Votto. Knocked in the game's only run with Hamilton at third after a stolen base of second and went to third on a wild pitch. I mean we are talking about a massive lead at first base and there he goes and Ross will throw down and no chance. David Ross got a pretty good throw off there. He got rid of the ball quickly, but you're not going to get Hamilton there. See that big pad on the left hand of Hamilton. One and one now to Joey. Hamilton a huge lead again. Looking back there, Lester, and he'll step off the rubber. You know. It goes to show you how sometimes stats can tell a story and sometimes they lie. David Ross, by the end of this year, may have the worst caught stealing percentage of any catcher in the league. And that is not a reflection in any way, shape, or form of David Ross as a catcher or a thrower. There's nothing he can do about it. Because we know this guy can catch and throw. Yes. And Billy doing everything he can to try to get in the head of Lester. And I would imagine David Ross at this point is saying, look, forget about it. We got to get the hitter here. If you feel like he's going, do you want to pitch out? There we go. Hamilton keeps drifting, drifting, and again, enough to force Lester to bluff the throw. We can do this all night long. And one Nevado. And now ball at two strikes. Cowboy, I would ask the question and one do. There's no debate that it's distracting to Lester. Is there a point where it becomes distracting to Votto? I, I think in a certain sense, maybe. But I think for Joey right now, he is so locked in. I don't think so. I think the more distracted that you see the pitcher on the mound, the more confidence you build as a hitter at the plate. Joey gone swinging. One away in the inning. might be thinking here I need to get third during this at bat to Frazier with one out now in the inning. Well there is something going on here between David Ross and oh, the yeah. plate umpire. No doubt about it. Well, we brought it up earlier. Saw the manager come out. 
Saw Lester talking to the home plate umpire in between innings. And clearly there's some jawing going on between Ross and Jeff Nelson as Hamilton takes off. Throw down a third and he's safe. So he does get there with one out in the inning. Three stolen bases already tonight for Billy Hamilton. 12 on the year. And I'll say this, I don't know that you can get rid of the ball and throw it more accurately than what David Ross did right there. I mean, that is a perfect throw. But Billy Hamilton was almost halfway before the ball was ever delivered. So now a chance to knock in Hamilton. The Cubs have the infield in. Now they back up. And they appeal he did not go around 2-0. Last time Todd had a runner at third and less than two outs, he popped up. That was in Milwaukee two nights ago. Takes a strike there, two and one. And it was Hamilton standing at third in that situation in a tie game. Turns out the very next batter at the plate, Francisco Rodriguez threw a wild pitch and Hamilton scored the winning run. You can bet every time that Hamilton is at third, he's reading downward tilt from the pitcher. Any ball that heads towards the dirt, he's getting an, an aggressive two to three steps afterwards. That ball carries right or left, he's going to keep right on coming. Ball four. First walk of the game by Lester. And now they're on the corners, one away. Reds leading one nothing, and here comes Brandon Phillips. Lester is throwing a pile of pitches early on here tonight. 52 of them. And we're only one out into the third inning. And we also know that Frazier can steal a base. Over 20 stolen bases last year. And why would you not, especially with Hamilton at third, you want to stay out of the double play anyway? Hey, I don't know if Billy Hamilton is actually thinking about it. But if he did think about it, Steve, he could steal home. Off home. home. With that leg kick and as deliberate as he is being with his back to Hamilton. Frazier takes off and by doing so they'll stay out of the double play. So as you pointed out, Cowboy, that's why you start the running. And it's a 2-0 ball game. It's a good pitch by Lester. He gets the ball in on the hands of Phillips. But with the runner moving, that's an automatic run. We love the aggressiveness by Brian Price. And why wouldn't you, as we pointed out? Now, Frazier going to try and create a little bit more habit. Jay Bruce looks at a breaking ball to strike. Jay struck out swinging in the first inning. Even as aggressive as the Reds have been here in the early going, Lester has not even made an attempt to throw a ball to any bat. I think basically what John Lester's defense is at this point with a runner in second, if the lead gets too big, he's just going to step on. He's not going to throw the ball back there. What I'd be curious to see is if Frazier got a huge lead and he did step off and Frazier took off, what would he do? Then you have to throw the ball to a bag at that point. One and two on Jay Bruce. Right. 
Lester's next pitch will be number 60. Or 59, I beg your pardon. Time for Bruce to come up with a base hit. Soft liner will end the inning. But the Reds again run. Billy run into their second run of the game. World Championship team, and I had a few guys that could hit, just a few, including look at Hal Morris's numbers. He hit 340 in 1990. That is not a typo, folks. And we are with Hal Morris right now, as uh, many of the 1990 Reds are, are up here in the handlebar. And uh, what's it like getting together with these guys again? It's a lot of fun. Haven't seen a lot of the guys for 15, 20 years. And to have everyone here, I think everyone in the whole club is here. It's, it's just a big thrill. Now, you guys had a lot of characters on that team. Have, have, has any of these guys changed tonight? Because there's some big names back here, and I see a lot of laughs going on. Very little has changed in that time. There were characters then, and there are characters today. Who would be, I mean, if you had to choose one guy, one guy that was more nuts than any of them. Is it hard to narrow it down to one? It's hard. I mean, I might start with Lou, but but uh, with the players, uh, you know, Sabes, Randy, Rob, there, there were quite a few. I know when it happens, you guys kind of don't realize, you know, the importance of, of maybe what you guys accomplish. But do you realize now how special you are in the lore of Cincinnati Reds history? Well, you know, at the time, I thought we'd be back the next year. And uh, obviously that didn't happen. And, and as you get older and time passes by, as you reflect upon your accomplishment, it starts to sink in a little bit. And I think I'm starting to realize it these days. 340. Wow. That had to be a, a fun year. Well, it, it was. And like I said, Lou matched me up real well. And uh, we had a lot of speed hitting in front of me. So I got a lot of good pitches to hit. 
Tell the fans what you're doing now. You're in the uh, Angels organization. You're a big wig. Uh, no, I'm the director of pro scouting for the Angels, so I, I watch a lot of ball games. Really having fun watching this game with Leak and Lester and the, the fine young players and the Reds and the Cubs. So uh, trying to keep tabs on what everyone in the game's doing. Got any tips that you would you know, like to uh, to give the Cincinnati Reds here since you're such a big wig in baseball now? Ooh. Um, uh, not too many, but uh, listen, they're, they've got a good ball club, and uh, if everyone stays healthy, they'll be in this, you know, in the thick of things the rest of the year. Appreciate your time. Have fun with the guys tonight. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, let's go back to the booth. How more is that guy could flat out rake Tom And, and he certainly had one of the oddest approaches to hitting, really, of almost any player you will ever see. Although before we get to that, Cowboy, I'm kind of curious here. After a leadoff double, this is a second meeting on the mound now among the trio of Pena, Leak, and Phillips. What do you think might be going on here? I think they're just trying to make sure that they're on the same page as far as what signal that they will use with a runner at second. Maybe Brandon saw something from Fowler out there and Soler back and forth. Any kind of communication, you want to make sure you nip that in the bud. All right, leadoff double. Reds leading 2 nothing. Breaking ball is low to Soler. But let's Slide go back. out to center his first time. Let's go back to Hal Morris. I can remember playing against when he was at Michigan with Larkin and Sabo. They came down to play us at Mississippi State. Now, he didn't have all of that moving around in the box, and he could still hit. When I got to the big leagues and got over here to the Reds, he almost had a little two-step before he hit the baseball. Yep. Almost a crow hop coming to the ball. But I'm telling you, Contact as good as anybody I've seen. Reds got him in a deal from the Yankees. Lou Pinella knew all about him there. More importantly, Bob Quinn knew all about him there, the general manager. Boy, it was wonderful to see him here tonight. One of the great gentlemen to ever work in the game of baseball, Bob Quinn, the Reds general manager of that 1990 World Championship team. He's a guy, along with Mark Shot, that hired Lou Pinella. Two and one on Solaire. Fowler in second with nobody out. Swing and a miss. And the runner is going to advance to third base. Or was it foul tipped? I think Brian Price just, or Brian Pena just missed it. It was a breaking ball into the dirt. And instead of blocking it, he tried to glove it. And that didn't quite work so well. Well, Solaire is still standing at the plate. Did they have the count? Oh, it was two and one the count, we're being told, not one and two. So two and two, and that is a wild pitch. All right. I have I don't know that I've seen this much, this many meetings, this much talking, manager to the umpire, the hitters to the umpire, pitcher to the umpire. We've not seen this much in a while. Well, the bottom line is there's a runner at third with nobody out. And with everything that has gone on tonight, it feels like the Reds should be ahead by three or four. Even even Brandon Phillips and Zach Kozart don't seem to be quite meshed on what's going on. And there's the continued conversation out there. Struck him out. For the first out of the inning. And for Leak. That is his fourth strikeout of the game. And now it's time for Cholula's flamethrower. And it's brought to you by Cholula Hot Sauce. And here down and in, and he got it by a pretty good fastball hitter in Solaire. That's a big strikeout. You know, even with all the semantics going on on the field, that's the one guy that is one cool customer, Mike Lee. Strike one on Anthony Rizzo, who bounced out to Phillips. This first time up. They could have a bonfire on the mound and he's not going to sweat a lick. In the air right center field and this game is tied just like that.
Let that ball run back over the plate on him. Tried to get it in on the hands of the left handed hitter, and it just runs back a little bit too far. That's where this ball starts. In, and it runs back to the plate a little bit too much. So the Cubs get their first two hits of the game in this inning, producing a run. And there's another hit. Bird able to smother that one. Off the end of the bat, little flare by Bryant. Cubs now have to go ahead and run aboard. If a lot of these young Cub players play to their potential, and we know there's no guarantee of that, but if they do, this has the makings of a very dominant offensive team. They have got guys that can hit. They have guys with thunder. Now, whether it all comes together this year, whether it ever comes together, we'll know. But potentially, pretty good looking group. And if you think about it, you got Wellington Castillo and Miguel Montero sitting on the bench right now. Both those guys to swing the bat pretty well in their own rights. And the only reason one of those guys is not catching tonight is because David Ross is the personal catcher for John Lester. And we'll see Montero. You can take that to the bank. Tomorrow with Anthony DiSclefani on the mound and more than likely because it's a day game he'll come right back and catch again on Sunday. He is their primary guy. Oh boy. So with all the talk about Lesky. Here Leak throws over to first base and throws it away and he'll be charged with an error. Just held on to that one a bit too long as the ball goes back into the runner. Well, there was not a whole lot Votto could do there. So now Coglin with a count of one and one, and that was swung on and fouled out of play. One ball, two strikes. Mike Leake's got to get it back together here. He allowed that double. A wild pitch move to runner to third. He got a big strike out of Solaire. Rizzo hit the ball in the seats, followed by a bloop single, then a throwing error by Leake. And the Cubs have the go ahead run at second base with one out. If you want with us, Coglin coming into the game, eight for eight in his career against Mike Leake. Leak got him on a pop up to Jay Bruce his first time up. Just not, they are just not on the same page. And when you have a runner at second base, you're using a series of three or four signs so that the runner at second base can't relay the signs to the hitter at the plate. And when you shake off once and twice, you're going through eight, 12, 16 signs. you may remember was given a couple of big leads in that outing against Chicago at Wrigley Field a week ago a little more than a week ago three nothing he gave up three immediately in the bottom half of the inning they got him three more 
He gave up one more and then they took him out of the game. Fly ball to Bruce and right. And the runner going to stay put. Two away in the inning. As always, we know you'll look forward to our Miller time moment. It's coming your way later tonight, thanks to Miller Light. One more out to go, and it's a tough one. Starlin Castro. Yeah, you look back at that Cubs ball game. He's too locked up in that game. It was Soler that was the big hero in that game. This half inning has seemed like it has taken an eternity. Well, you mentioned with all the beatings, there have been at least uh, three, if not four of them. That ball driven hard into deep right center field. Hamilton back to the wall. He's got it. How about Billy Hamilton? He's doing it all here tonight. He came very close to winning a gold glove as a rookie. That might be in store for 2015. The play by Billy Hamilton on a ball that was stroked off the bat of Starlin Castro. A high breaking ball. Hamilton gets a great jump. The ball carries out there in right center field. No fear for that man. All right, let's see if the Reds can get back at it against John Lester. I mean, it's not like they're not going to cover off the ball. They've been extremely fortunate that Hamilton, in two innings of this game, has let off, and each time he had a base hit. No one fouled it over the screen and out of play by Marlon Bird. He stole second in the first inning, went to third on a wild pitch, scored on a ground out. The Reds had Frazier follow with a double. But Phillips and Bruce struck out. Bird let off the second inning with a hit, but never attempted to run as Lester retired the next three. And this one hooked down the line, and Marlon Bird is two for two tonight. A leadoff double.
That is a four straight inning. The Reds have let off with a base hit. Tell you, the big fella for the Reds starting to get it going a little bit. Maybe that long home run that he hit in Milwaukee has got him back to seeing the ball well. That ball was stroked into the corner. Hamilton led off the third with a single, stole second, stole third, and for the second time he scored on a ground out. Really big opportunity for the Reds to answer the Cubs and that home run by Rizzo. Pena had certainly what you could call an odd and bat his first time up. He tried to bunt the first pitch, was down a strike. And then he looked at two pitches and was gone. Bird's coming to third and he'll get there. One away in the inning. We call it April in the OH IO on Fox Sports Ohio. You can win some great sports experiences. Lunch with catcher Brian Pena, an autographed jersey, a $500 cash card. Text April in Ohio to 733-733. Message and data rates may apply. Big month. Infield in. 2-2 game. Cozart the batter. Runner at third. I wonder how much Cowboy does he get to hit in this at bat? You could see where David Ross was setting up there. Almost a high target up around the hands of Kozar. Normally that means you're trying to get the guy to pop it up. Squeeze coming and it's fouled out of play. If you get that one down, Marlon Bird, he could have crawled home. I think that surprised everybody. One and one to Cozart, infield in. Wow. A fastball knee high taken for a strike on a 1 1 pitch. Well, Fox Track says not a strike. Started to go. He did not go around 2 and 2 on Kozoy. I think that goes back to what we were talking about earlier with David Ross and where he sets up with his mitt. He puts that mid out there. It is giving Lester an extra inch or two, maybe three on each side of the plate. By the way, that man's setting up. Well, Lester is certainly not backing down with a runner at third with a pitcher on deck. He is coming after Kozoy. Barely got a piece, ran that one up under his hands. Still two and two on Zach. Cozart struck out swinging his only time up tonight. This crowd has almost been lulled to sleep by the pace of this one so far. They say it'll give him some energy. Three and two now on Ross. Well, Ross did a really good job of keeping that ball in front. Anytime you've got a cutter coming to the plate, the ball dips down and it catches the plate itself. Almost a wet grass effect. It skips off the plate. If you don't get down in time, that ball will go right between your legs as a catcher. One or third to go ahead and run. Marlon Bird, one out in the inning. And it's three and two on Zach Kozar. They clearly believe the place to get Cozart out is in and up. Because when they need to make a pitch, at least through the that's first two at bats, that's where they're going. 
And they're going there with the cutter. The ball starting on the plate, so it looks like a strike to Zach. And with a 3-2 counter runner at third, you have a pretty good idea that you're going to get a swing from the pitcher spot. Eighth pitch in the at bat. And beautifully done by Kozai. Drives this one to center. Fowler will track it. But a sack fly RBI by Kozai. Well done, young man. 3-2, Reds back in front. That, folks, is textbook. You get the double, you get him over with the at-bat by Pena, and a great at-bat there by Zach Kozart getting the fly ball into center field. That is what we call manufacturing a run. You know, it's interesting here, you and I both notice it, you know, when they, when they were going for the out of Kozart there, they were coming in or going up. That pitch was more out over the plate, almost away from it. Well, where they were trying to go, Tom, was trying to get that paralyzed call that they got earlier, and that was a cutter. And you could see that ball start off the plate, but instead of having a short break, it carries all the way back middle away, and Kozart was able to get the bat head to it. That was a mistake by Lester. One and two on Mike Leak, who's still in search of his first hit this year. Leak was among the very best hitting pitchers in all of baseball his first four years in a league. Took a bit of a dip last year and looking for hit number one this year. The Reds answer, though, the Cubs two run top of the inning with a tie breaking one of their own. I'm Jim Day. Something very special happened this past weekend in St. Louis. There was a young lady that was battling cancer that Skip Schumacher went over and took pictures with and said hello to. And on that day, he was the only one that went over and talked to Ashley Kitchen. And it meant so much to her and her family. Well, we found out yesterday that unfortunately, Ashley, well, she gained her wings and she's no longer with us as she passed away. And the family went on to Facebook and tried to get a hold of Skip Schumacher and to let him know how much just coming over and saying hello meant to her. And Skip went back on Facebook and said, I'm so sorry for your loss. I remember talking to her about her baseball designs on her nails. She seemed really sweet and much too young to be gone. It was my pleasure to meet her and I'm praying for her family during this trying time. So young, she leaves behind two beautiful girls. But that's the type of guy Skip Schumacher is, and that's the type of, just the type of thing that someone of notoriety can have an effect on a life of a family. And we send out our condolences to their family as well, and we salute Skip Schumacher for being the guy he is. He's a good man. That is a, uh, 
It's a nice story about Skip. Very sad story, more importantly, about that young lady. Family, our thoughts and prayers are with them all. Schumacher, one of those guys that when he leaves the team, he leaves them better than what they were when he got there. Well put. And he's not a starter. He's a guy that comes off the bench and plays. But he understands the game and he understands a leadership role, even though folks would not say, OK, well, Skip Schumacher is the leader of this club. I guarantee you he has a huge voice in there because of his experience and because of his inner heart and pull for the guys that are on the field. All right, big inning here now for Mike Leak. His team has given him now a second lead to work with, granted only a single run. And he'll take care of Ross on a 3 2 pitch on the ground ball to Frazier. You have Ross, the pitcher, and then the number nine hitter, Addison Russell, here in the Chicago fifth. Hey, maybe Joe Madden knows what he's doing. David Ross has let off an inning twice. If he does get a base hit, then you've got. Your pitcher spot in a position to bunt him along, but he didn't get on. Well, Joe Madden certainly proved in Tampa Bay that he knows what he's doing. I was being facetious. I know you were, and everybody <laughs> else knows you were too. But you know, they started they being Tampa Bay the same year as an expansion club. The Arizona Diamondbacks started in 1998. The Diamondbacks a year later. Won a divisional title. Two years later, they won a World Series. Phillips to his right, two around. Meanwhile, Tampa Bay is floundering along, floundering along, floundering along. I mean, they were awful. It's the only way to describe it. It was just an awful franchise and team. Nobody went to the games. And then all of a sudden, they they, they start doing a better job of drafting. They make some real nice trades with some veteran guys they have. And they give a guy a chance. Hard to believe as it may be now. For those of us who knew Joe Madden during his days with the Angels, where he served in every capacity really you could in the minor leagues before Mike Socia made him a very integral part of his major league coaching staff. They hired this guy that a lot of people had never heard of. Yeah, I remember what you're talking about. When the Rays first started, they tried to sign all these big free agents and tried to make their club that way and really kind of skimped on the scouting and development issue. Well, come full circle, that's the club that that's how they live now. Scouting, development, bringing guys to the big leagues. Of course, they lost their uh, general manager to the Dodgers as it's three and one on Russell. Madden nine years led the Rays to four postseason appearances and won an American League pennant. Three and two. Addison Russell is the youngest player in the National League. And he looks at he looks into that camera. <laughs> he is a young fella. 21 years, 91 days. Only Ranger Rugnet Odur is younger at 21 years, 80 days. Sudden it looked like it then snapped dragon on the inside corner. Oh, doctor, was that nice?
anniversary of the 1990 World Champion Cincinnati Reds. I'm Jim Day. We're with Paul O'Neill, who still makes his home here in Cincinnati. How awesome is this night? It really is. It's a beautiful night. I mean, it, it, crowds out here. You, you see guys you haven't seen in 20 years, and it, it's like you just saw them yesterday. So it's, uh, you know, anytime you have a reunion, it's great because you're celebrating something. The World Series is something to celebrate, but then all of a sudden you put a number on it, 25 years. It's really amazing. Well, we're getting grief back here because Danny Jackson is sitting back here, and he says we're Andrews do, you know. They've always got that little crack. He, he says we're blocking their view. He's watching the game. We are very sorry about this. But, you know, Paul O'Neill is hard to rope in to get to the interview, so we got to do it when we can do it. That is very true. Uh, you went on to greatness, obviously, with the Yankees as well. Uh, how special was it winning it the first time, though? Well, I mean, it was really special because, um, you know, that, that was the first World Series, obviously. And it's, you know, you, I, I won it with, with guys that I came through the whole Reds uh, system with. Played in the minor leagues with Chris Sabo, Eric Davis, Barry Larkin. And, you know, when, when you go through the minor leagues with guys, you know what it's like. You get an opportunity in the major leagues and then win a World Series pretty much. I mean, I'm from Ohio, so in, in like a hometown thing. It was I'll never, something I'll never forget. He's the pride of Columbus, Ohio, as Billy Hamilton is called out at first base. What are your impressions? I know you uh, are still in the game as far as an analyst. What are your impressions of a guy like uh, Billy Hamilton? I love to see that part of the game come back. I mean, in the past 10, 15 years, you've gotten away from speed and stolen bases and waited for guys to hit home runs. And it's a it's an exciting part of the game. And, uh, you know, I was always, as a little kid, used to love to watch Lou Brock and, and guys that could steal braces. And, uh, you know, it, he is such a big part of their offense. If other guys swing the bats, it takes a lot of pressure off him. He'll score a ton of runs. It's cool seeing these uh, throwback unis tonight and wearing number 21 tonight is Todd Frazier. Are you aware that growing up you were his favorite player? <laughs> you know you fool a couple of them along the way but I, I you know I like watching him too. I love you know he's he's intense he plays hard and uh, you know he's, he's done some good things here since he's been here. One last question why do you still make your home here? Well, I was born and raised in Ohio and my wife Columbus guy. Yeah my wife was also it's just you know we ended up playing here living here my kids were raised here we still go to New York but we always come back home, and Ohio is home. Well, we appreciate your time, and uh, lots of luck. You're enjoyed or listen to on the tube as well. All right. Thank you very much. That is Paul O'Neill, Tom and Cowboy, one of the best. Nickname Big, and he's still big. <laughs> O'Neill looks like he could still play now. He's in that kind of shape. He might even be in better shape now than he was as a player. Meanwhile, I'm not sure you'll see a better play with Billy Hamilton running that we just saw a moment ago by the shortstop turned second baseman Addison Russell to throw out Hamilton on a bang bang play to begin the inning. That's a huge play in this game. Yeah well you you dive towards the second base bag and this is the shortstop arm. He comes up and he throws a bullet to first base. That's the only way you're going to get Hamilton on a play like that is a strong throw. Votto called out on strikes. Two away here in the inning. And that's seven strikeouts in a game for Lester. Big sweeping breaking ball. Ross wants it inside and it ends up coming all the way across the plate. Here we are in the fifth. This is the first inning where the Reds did not have a base hit to start an inning. Three of the four times. That base hit came in to score. Strike one to Frazier. Tied with a double. And he's drawn a walk. Three runs, five hits. One error, three left for Cincinnati. Two runs, three hits, no errors. One left for Chicago. We're just short, and I mean just short. Of a sellout tonight. Tomorrow, a sellout crowd expected. And we're hoping that Mother Nature will cooperate tomorrow. Sunday tickets are available, and we'd love to have you come on down for the series finale. 110 start time, Jason Marquis against former Red Travis Wood.
he hadn't had a chance to see Anthony DeSclafani pitch, that's worth the price of admission. It's interesting to know that these are the exact same pitching matchups each of these three games that we had in Chicago a little more than a week ago. Leak against Lester. Tomorrow, Di Scalfani was better than Arietta. A 1 2 3 inning for the first time tonight. We go to the sixth. Reds lead the Cubs 3 2. Local Ford dealer Ford go further and by Cincinnati Children's ranking third in the country on the U.S. News and World Reports best children's hospitals in America MLB.tv premium allows you to watch every out of market game live or on demand at true HD blackout and other restrictions do apply visit MLB.tv for details 3-2 Reds it was a top part of the batting order, which started the Cub two run rally off leak in the fourth. Fowler double scored on a home run from Rizzo. Leak struck him out, leading off the game. Starting pitchers, both Lester and Lee, they want this win. Neither one of them have a W at this point. In a one run ball game, one pitch could make all the difference in the world. Struck him out to begin the inning. Six of those tonight for Mike Lee. Door cutter a little higher, I think, than where Leak wanted it, but it does the job anyway. Now, Solaire.
As Cowboy mentioned, uh, Solaire was the big hero. The game the league started. Well, the Cubs ended up winning that one in 10 innings. Lee hit a two run, or gave up a two run home run to Solaire in the first inning. The Reds took a 6 4 lead when Lee came out of the game. And after Jumbo Diaz walked Anthony Rizzo to begin the eighth, Solaire tied the game with a two run home. And there's strike three. Now, coming up tonight, don't just call it a night when the ball game's over. We have history in New York. The first place Yankees host the first place Mets. The Mavericks will take the floor without Rondo. Trying to avoid an 0-3 hole, so we'll tell you everything going on after Reds Live, the post game for Fox Sports Live, right here on Fox Sports Ohio or on Fox Sports 1. But tonight here at the ballpark, we will have all of the post game gathering from the members here from that 1990 World Series championship team celebrating their 25th reunion. Here's Rizzo, who muscled one to the seats in right center field his last time up. That's the one spot that Rizzo has a little bit of difficulty with. A hard breaking ball down and in. He sees it as a fastball. That's where you get a lot of swing and misses, but you have to set it up to get there. Two and two. Will he go three in a row? Yes, he did. Rizzo never moves from the batter's box. I mean, not one foot, nothing. And Ling never leaves that room. These two guys come to play ball. Payoff pitch. See, after those early curveballs, three in a row, Rizzo a little tardy on that fastball in that time. Don't think I would double up with the heater in here. Just off the outside corner. Tried to sink it down and away, and the ball got underneath it, and it runs up and out of the strike zone. So a two out walk to Rizzo allows Bryant to come to the plate. Strike one. Bryant popped Tabato in the second inning and looped one into short left field for a single his last time up. Toughest thing for a young hitter to master is the big league strike zone. That first pitch was well in off the plate. Bryant took a hack at it. Second pitch, he decided to let it pass. Fastball on the outside corner to get ahead one and two. It's a very important batter in this game. All of them are in a one run game. Now trying to retire Bryant and get the Reds back to the plate. Drops down on him and just missed. We don't see that very often from Lee. 
Luke tried to start that one off the plate a little further, and by dropping down, he was hoping to let it run back more to the plate. It just didn't quite get there. 2 2 delivery. Came hard in. Full count. And this at bat, Mike has thrown Chris Bryant five consecutive fastballs. Three inside, two away. Three, two, coming. Runner goes off the end of the bat, short left field. And this will do it in the Cubs' six. Lake taking care of business. A 22 pitch inning, but a scoreless inning. Jay Bruce in 2007 was named the Baseball America's Minor League Player of the Year. Chris Bryant was last year. Look at the numbers. Bryant with more home runs, more RBIs. Batting averages a wash. Jay had more doubles. I would say if Chris Bryant could get off to the start that Jay Bruce had, he'd be awfully happy. Well, you know, it's interesting when you take a look. And what Bryant has done so far. He is the first player to reach base at least seven times, 17 times in his first seven major league games since Jay Bruce in 2008. I can remember when Jay Bruce came to the big leagues, he was smoking. Everything he hit was a laid out rope. Lester coming off his first perfect inning of the night. Reds lead three to two. Hit a ton down the left field line, but bending foul. More air than distance. It would have been very close. John Lester given the seven year contract, huge money. Tonight, his fourth start as a Cub, and he is still in search of his first win. Lee came in hitting 353 against him in 15 plus innings and allowed 24 hits, 12 earned runs. He's got that pitch working tonight. He struck out three in a row, give him nine in the game. This is a curveball, and it comes back door to Brandon Phillips. What the Reds have seen through the first five innings are those cutting fastballs. 
They come out of the hands, same plane as the heater, and then they dart back to the plate. That one there, a little slower, gets the hitter out in front, and he had Brandon off balance. And he's really twisted Bruce in knots tonight. Got him on a strikeout in the first inning, and then Jay lines softly to the second baseman his last time up. Since the double by Marlon Bird, seven in a row now retired by Lester. Two and oh one Jay. And now two and one. Lester much more fluid here tonight than what we saw in Chicago seems to have a better rhythm in his mechanical delivery and his stuff is better a little more crisp as the ball gets to the plate. Struck out by Lester. He's fan 10 in the game. Watch where David Ross sets up. There's the plate, and you can see the mitt on the outside part of the plate. You see how he darts that mitt down. He doesn't change the wrist, he just eases the thumb down a bit. You get the call. It's been a real good night for Marlon Bird. Single to right his first time up and double scored a run and double down the left field line in the fourth inning. He's hit the ball hard twice. And he hits his ball in the air. Center field that will end the inning. Lester back to back perfect innings retires a final nine. Go to the seventh. Reds lead by a run. Destination. Kids 14 and younger receive an Aroldis Chapman poster presented by College Advantage. Plus, take advantage of special family ticket offers. Enjoy live mascot races, faint painters, and a game so much more. 513 381 REDS. Did face you say painters. face painters? Face painter is what I meant to say. I wonder if I could get in there and maybe see if they could fix me up a mustache. I may have said a, a fate. Painter. Well, I knew what you meant. I just was thinking about maybe getting a mustache. That'd be a good look for you. Go along with that beret that we uh, 
had the picture of you of last week in Chicago. Maybe they can give me a handlebar. Now that is a look. A handlebar with the cowboy beret. I don't want the beret. Well, I want the flat top stove top hat. That's my favorite looking hat. Sweet. I love them. A lot of people don't like that. That's a foul ball. Oh, and two to Cotlin. All right, Leach knocking on the door of 100 pitches, but a guy like him, you know, more times than not, we talk about this frequently as we did with Johnny Cueto the other night. Brian Price knows these guys inside and out. Now he's coming off a lengthy inning. He it's will get leeway. He'll get leeway where a young starter would not, as Cueto did the other night in Milwaukee. In the air by Coglin, the left field hit pretty well. Marlon Bird at the wall and Leak serves up the home run to begin the inning, and we're tied at three. Mike got underneath that one a little bit, and the ball, instead of sinking down in a way, it sails up in a way, and Coglin just goes right with it out over the plate. We gave you the numbers coming into the ball game. Coglin has hit the fastball well off of Leak. Eight for eight coming in. And he does damage here. Well, give the Cubs credit. Uh, whenever they have fallen behind Mike Leak, they certainly don't wave the white flag. They just keep on fighting. They did it last time, and they've done it twice here tonight. Reds gave him a 2-0 lead before the Rizzo home run, a 3-2 lead before the Conlin home run. Well, I think Starlin Castro talked about it a couple of days ago. He said, in the past few years when we got behind, it wasn't as though we gave up, but we didn't have that instinct that we could come back and he said now we feel like we can come back whenever we're behind well, he's right and you have to have that if you're going to have a winning club and you know the other thing about it is cowboy and we've talked about this you and i talked about it off the air is is we remember a long stretch there a number of years ago when the Astros were in the National League where they just wore the Reds out. Just wore them out. Didn't matter where they played, the Reds were not going to beat the Houston Astros. And then all of a sudden, the Reds got it turned around in that divisional championship year of 2010. And every time they faced the Astros after that, until they moved leagues, it was a Reds' turn. No team had the Reds dominated the last number of years like they have dominated the Cubs. They have won 61 of the last 91 games these teams have played. Only the Braves 63 and 35 record has more wins than against another opponent among all the matchups in baseball going back to 2010 than the Reds 61 wins against Chicago. But in September of last year, the Reds were swept in Chicago as it's still one and two on Ross. And the Cubs dominated that series. Shut them out twice. Arietta nearly threw a no hitter. Their first series this year, the Cubs won two out of three. I don't think there's any doubt that the Cubs are quite the improved team. In the air right field and Bruce at the base of the wall will haul it in. Take a look at this. League throws a pitch. Ross both feet out of the box which you're not allowed to do and is talking to the umpire. Got that foot right back in there. It doesn't mean that you can't talk to the umpire. You just got to keep your feet in the box. Or at least one of them. Well, the way Lester is putting it together, they're going to let him bat. Well, he's throwing the ball better now than he has probably at any time this year that we've seen. Any time the Cubs have seen. I mean, 
And this is by far. He's, he's on a stretch now where he's in start. He has retired nine consecutive reds, five via the strikeout. And that comes all the way back from the double in the fourth inning by Marlon Bird. His first start of the year against the Cardinals, four and a third, eight hits, three runs out of the game. Got the loss. Six innings, six runs, ten hits against the Reds and a no decision. And then his last start against San Diego only lasted five and a third, gave up six hits, two walks, and three runs. Two two. Hitting over. But the home run by Coglin ties the game. Reds will bat in the bottom of the seventh when we return. Here in Cincinnati this summer, visit T-Mobile All-Star Fan Fest. Now that's the world's largest interactive baseball theme park. It'll be over at the Duke Energy Convention Center, July 10th through the 14th. Now that you can buy tickets to right now. Just go to allstargame.com. Well, tonight, members of the 1990 Reds World Series champions came in on the Fan Express to Great American Ballpark. To find out how you can do the same with your group, call 513-765-7600 or visit reds.com slash fan express. A Hall of Famer, Barry Larkin. Norm Charlton, Rob Dibble, Randall Kirk. Myers, the nasty boys. They're giving away those... Uh, those bobbleheads of a nasty boys tomorrow. All right, here we go now. 3-3 game after the home run by Coglin in the top of the inning. They let Lester bat to make the final out in the seventh, and then they bring on the left-hander Phil Coke. One and one. Diaz throwing in the Reds bullpen. Mike Lee do up third here in this inning, and I imagine he is probably done for the night. Lee only gave up four hits, three runs, but two of the four hits, long ones. A two run home run to Rizzo. And that would have served down the right field line into the corner. And Pena on his way to second base. And he's going to come to. No, he's not. He thought about it. 
And then he says, all right, that's enough. Jim Riggleman had his hands <laughs> high into the air. He was jumping up and down. Stop! A line drive down the right field line. And if you're not used to the corner here at Great American Ballpark, as that ball gets down into the corner, if it catches the wall, it will hug the fence. And that's exactly what happens to Jorge Soler. Ball rolled right on by. Of course, we saw Pena as a runner in Milwaukee when the Reds tried to butt him over, and he was easily thrown out. And that's not a knock on him. Just he runs like he runs. That was a force out. This would be a tag play. But they're going to pinch hit for Leak next. And at least no sign of a bun on the first pitch to Zach Kozoy. 0 oh 2. But at the very minimum now, in an 0 2 count, Kozart has to find a way to get that runner to third base. Mazzarocco stands in the on deck circle. Playing a good four or five steps into the into the outfield grass. So any ball that's hit to the right side is going to move Pena to third easily. Well, let's uh, look what I found for David Ross. That one almost got the back foot of Kozar. Fine, you're right, Tom. <laughs> I think David Ross was heading to the backstop. Oh, it's a Michael. Two and two now on Cosa. That's a go ahead run out there at second base with nobody out. If a red homer is off a Toyota sign, Luke Wheeler from Hamilton will win the new Tundra, and you can register for your chance to win. Just stop by your Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky Toyota dealer. Pena a double to begin the red seventh in a 3-3 game. 2-2 Two -two pitch. And a full count. The Reds in one run games this year, five and two. Those one run games, some of the little things oftentimes decide winning and losing. 3 2 pitch. This is not going to advance the runner. One away in the inning. Joe Madden is heading to the mound. Face Mesa Rocco, and we'll have our skyline chili call to the bullpen. 3 3 game in the seventh. Coke one third allows a hit. We're back in a moment.
It may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. And the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of the Cincinnati Reds. Reds three, Cubs three. Brian Pena at second base, one out in the inning. Devin Mezzarocco, the pinch hitter. Those two little rascals still at it tonight. Grandma and Grandpa have their hands full here. And take it over on the mound. Gonzalez. German. Hard thrower. He's thrown the ball pretty well for these guys. Pitched a couple innings the other day against the Pirates. Did not allow a run, only allowed one hit. Bring it a little bit. Now, normally the G in some Spanish names is pronounced as a Yeah. But he goes by German. So be it. Meanwhile, Devin Mezzarocco is exclusively making his living pinch hitting right now as he tries to get better from that hip impingement as it was called. We saw him Tuesday for the first time his only appearance since May or April the 12th. He drew a walk as a pinch hitter. So you got to wonder about Mezzarocco's timing. I mean really you can take all the batting practice from now until the end of time. Toughest job in the game is what Mesoraco is trying to do right now, and that's pinch hit on a cool night when you're not loose at all. You've got to manufacture some adrenaline. Pretty good eye there. Two balls and a strike. Herman, German, excuse me, will slide the ball away from you, and then that hard sinker inside. He's trying to get Mesoraco to beat it in the ground. They appealed, he went around. Now the 2 2. And he thought about it. As the wind begins to pick up a little bit here in Great American Ballpark. Now this is one of those spots you cannot waste, Tom. A leadoff double. Cozart unable to get Pena over to third base. The Reds were able to do this earlier with the leadoff double by Marlon Bird. They have got to cash this run in. Two away in the inning. Fell out of it. Almost looked like a split finger changeup type pitch. So now it's up to Billy Hamilton. Two hits and three at bats, three stolen bases, two runs scored. Robbed of a hit. On a great play made by Addison Russell in the fifth inning. A leadoff double and Pena has not moved in a tie game. I mean, this guy did not, Jermin did not throw a fastball over 88 miles an hour to Mezzarocco. Threw him a lot of off speed pitches, the split finger, the slider. First two pitches to Hamilton, 93-94. Billy's got a lot of room on the left left field side of second base, with Castro standing right behind Pena at second. Heading over leadoff double and Pena basically drops anchor at second base. We're tied at three.
list. John Lester, he could create some problems that he did in the first inning and again in the third, stealing three bases, scoring two runs. Stole second to first, wild pitch got him down to third. That was in the first inning, scored third inning, stole second, stole third, scored again. Reds had a 2 0 lead until Rizzo played long ball to right center, nodding the game at two. The Reds would take a 3 2 lead in the bottom of that inning, but then Coglin, who came into this game 8 for 8 against Mike Leak. Leak retired him his first two times up, but Coglin bit him in the seventh with a game tying home run. And that's where we stand as we go to the eighth. And taking over for Mike Leak, who gave the Reds seven outstanding innings, allowed three runs and four hits, is Jumbo Diaz. And you look at who's due up in this inning, Tom. Addison Russell, Dexter Fowler, and Jorge Soler. So somewhere along the line, unless the Reds make a pitching change, which I don't think that they will, Jumbo Diaz will return to the scene of the crime in Chicago. When Jorge Soler comes to the plate, and he gave up an 0-2 home run to dead center that changed that ball game dramatically. That was a 6-4 lead at the time for the Reds in the eighth. After they took Leak out of the game, Jumbo walked the first batter, and then gave up the home run to Soler. A game the Cubs would win in extra innings. Leadoff walks have been one of the primary problems for what has been an unbelievably disappointing bullpen outside of a role as Chapman so far this year. And really, Tom, not just leadoff walks, walks, period. Because what ultimately happens, you walk batters, you get behind, you've got runners aboard. Then all of a sudden as a pitcher you feel like all right I've got to get a little bit more of the plate I don't want to walk anybody else and bada bing bada bang see ya out of the ballpark walks and home runs that will devastate a bullpen. Jumbo comes at 96 here and no young Mr. Russell batting a ninth in the batting order sees two fastballs nowhere near the strike zone from Diaz. And is hacking 2 and 0. Oh. Ninety seven on that one. Now those last two pitches, whether Russell swings or not, they're strikes right on the outside corner. I may have to go there one more time. Which he does and blows him away. He went 96, 97, 98 after falling behind 2 0. One away. Throw him the heater, Ricky. <laughs> it's cut it loose. Just short of 40,000 here tonight. It's been a good game. Reds 1-0 in the first, 2-0 in the third. Cubs tied it in the top of the fourth. Reds took the lead in the bottom of the fourth. Cubs tied it in the seventh. And here we are in the eighth. This is one of those games after winning three or four in Milwaukee. You can set the tone for the homestand with a win here tonight. Bruce will get to the short pop up. And now the matchup of Solaire v. Diaz. Well, after every game, we have Reds Live brought to you by Performance Kings Honda, and we will tonight, including the introductions of all of those that are here from the 1990 World Championship Reds team. They'll be recognized after the game tonight, and we'll have all the pregame ceremonies tomorrow, beginning at noon.
So Lara has two home runs and they came in the same game against the Reds. One of them against a the guy he faces right now which tied the game in the eighth inning. They face each other in the eighth inning tonight two and oh. Breaking ball for a strike. This is the pitch that could be the ultimate equalizer for Jumbo Diaz. But you can't rear back and try to throw it as hard as you can. You've got to let your fingers and the grip do the work. There it is again. Every batter that comes to the plate now after last year knows Diaz has that upper 90s fastball. That's what they're looking for. You sweep that breaking ball out there in the dirt, you're not going to get a swing. That pitch, you will. And that's what I'm talking about there. That pitch was 83 miles an hour. That's when you grip it really hard. You really try to crank it. It kills the speed of the pitch and it also creates bite that takes it out of the strike zone. Three and two on Solaire. Jumbo to the plate. And it's in the air. A liner and bird inning over. So Jumbo with a one, two, three, eight. How about that? Votto, Frazier, Phillips coming up in a three, three game. What has been a sore spot for the Reds, Jumbo Diaz makes it a positive here tonight. This is a confidence builder, not only for that man, but also for the Reds bullpen as he gets the final out of the man that hit him hard in Chicago. It's your Miller time moment of the game. Three up, three down, eight inning. That's the way you like to see it. That's what I'm talking about. All right now, Sherman on the mound. He came on to strike out Mezzarocco and Hamilton with a runner at second base in the seventh inning. He'll face Votto, Frazier, Phillips. Joey, for the first time all year, did not reach base in the game yesterday in Milwaukee. And he hit third in the lineup for the first time all year. He has not reached base in the game tonight. Although he did drive in a run on the ground out. He struck out swinging, struck out looking. 
But here we are late in a 3-3 game. And Votto just a man you want up there right here and right now. 2-0 delivery. 3-0. Rio taking a monster cut and fouls it away. Three balls and a strike. I think that pitch there in a nutshell tells you the health of Joey Votto and that left knee. 3-0 last year, that was an automatic take. This year, he's looking for a cookie he can hit out of here. We'll pull the string on him there, way out in front. Votto's wearing stirrups tonight. Joel, look at our statistician pointing there, and I, I would not have noticed it, but then once you actually do notice it, I can't remember the last player I saw at war. And by stirrups, what we mean showing the white of the sock down around the shoelaces, as you can see right down here. I didn't even know they made those anymore. Most guys just wear the solid red socks all the way down. Now they may pull the pants up to the knees, but they wear the solid red socks. He's those got, things are sweet. He's got the sanitaries on over that under there. Maybe he's putting them on in honor of the 1990 club, because that's what how they used right. to wear. These unis look pretty good. I like the ones with the cutoff sleeves. Yeah, those are sweet. Here's Frazier. But we didn't win a World Series. <laughs> well, still, those were great looking uniforms. Were they comfortable uniforms? They were the best. It's kind of like wearing a t shirt. Right. All right. Go ahead, run at first. No better time than the bottom of the eighth inning because you know who's down there getting loosened up right now. The big man. Well, you've got left, right, left coming up for the Cubs in the night. You could put a run on the board here. Make it awfully nice for Chapman. Like one to freeze you. Todd a double in the first inning. Walked in a third. Struck out in the fifth. By the way, very, very short lead over there at first. Nothing in two on Frazier. This guy's almost like Larry Anderson from days going by. The human slider. Split finger slider, split finger slider. And when he does throw a fastball, it's just for effect. One thing about Jermaine and what gives him some effectiveness as everything looks like he's throwing it a hundred miles an hour. He looks like he is just rearing back and letting it fly and the thing comes out 
at 85 with some sink. Go ahead, run it first. Nobody out. Two and two to Frazier. And a bouncing ball. Bryant throws across a diamond. Nowhere nearly in time. Votto was down on one knee, having slid into second base. And that'll be an infield hit. Anthony Rizzo did a pretty good job to keep that ball on the infield. Almost impossible play to get Frazier there because of the way that the ball made Bryant turn. Oh, what to do, what to do, what to do. Well, Brandon Phillips has been asked to do a little bit of everything for the Reds. Early in the season on that first homestand, the Reds asked him to put down a bunt in an exact same situation like this. Brandon did not get the job done. He has been through his career a guy that will do anything you ask him to do. Although he did not look too excited after the game when asked to bunt in that situation. The Cubs aren't sure. They've got Bryant even with the bag at third. They have Rizzo maybe a step in front. We'll see what they ask Phillips. No sign of a bunt. And he pulls it foul. Now do they give him one swing? And now ask him to bunt? Or he's your cleanup hitter? And you're not going to do it. You can understand both sides of this whole thing. Yes, he's a cleanup hitter, but he's a cleanup hitter this year without an extra base hit. But I'd show sure take a single right here. But then you have to ask yourself, you know, when you're considering all these things. Is the guy on deck going the way right now that you're going to butt in front of him? I mean, you, you're looking at everything. If you're Brian Price as a manager, you're looking at everything that you can possibly look at. The one thing that you are trying to stay out of is a double play, whether it be from Brandon Phillips or whether it be from the following batter. Let's say Phillips does bunt. Let's say they walk Jay Bruce to load the bases. The double play is in order again. One and one on Phillips. And he takes a strike. Giving Brandon a chance here. The one two delivery. Missed off the inside corner at 93, a rare fastball. And I, and I think if you're Brian Price, if you know that you had a little bit of disdain from Brandon for being asked to bunt his last time up in this very similar situation, you say as a manager, okay, I'm going to give you that shot, but you better get him in. And I think that plays into the mind of Brandon Phillips as well. I got to get the job done here. Brandon, that's what Brandon's saying to himself. Otherwise, I'm going to be button hitting in the four hall for the rest of the year. Two and two to count on Brandon Phillips. Oh boy. Oh boy. Two around the inning. There's a pitching change. We're back in a moment.
that's made the 14th through the 17th thanks to Reach Family Magazine. So for $48, you get four tickets and four Reds hats. How about that? Cheer on the Red Legs and save. 51331 REDS or visit Reds.com slash 4448. Two on, nobody out, becomes one on, two out. 3-3 three, three game. We're in the bottom of the eighth for Jay Bruce, and Zach Roscup is the pitcher. And more times than not, when Roscup comes into the ball game, he has a left-handed batter standing at the plate. All of Bruce's at bats came against John Lester. He struck out, lined softly to second. Struck out again. And he's behind 0 and 2 here. Slider probably here. Yeah, boy, that was no contest. Fans unhappy. Can't blame them. 3 3 game, we go to the ninth. Thing. Tomorrow, I mean, we're really getting started early at noon. Why, you may ask? Well, if you don't know, the Reds are celebrating the 25th year reunion of the 1990 World Championship of Cincinnati Reds, and they will honor that team on the field tomorrow before the 110 game, and we'll have all the festivities for you beginning at noon Eastern time. Matchup tomorrow. It was a great one in Chicago. The same two principals getting together. Anthony DiScofani has been the best Reds pitcher so far this year. Has yet to give up a run in his last two starts. And he'll be opposed by the best Cub pitcher so far this year. And it was DiScofani who beat Arietta at Wrigley Field. Of course, Arietta, the guy who Ruffled a lot of feathers. We talked about maybe giving him some ideas about things to do in Cincinnati because yeah. he made the comments about how he doesn't like coming here. So there was nothing to do. Nothing to do here. So maybe we can take him out to dinner. Yeah, yeah. give him a few ideas. 3 3 game. A roll to Chapman going right through the heart of the order. I mean, you want to talk about power against power? This is it. You have Chapman against Rizzo, Chapman against the young phenom Bryant, 
And then we'll see if Coglin faces Chapman. One and one. The last two innings, the Reds had a leadoff double in the seventh. Could not advance the runner any further. They didn't bunt. So, I mean, let's go back over the last two innings real quick. Double. You don't try to advance a runner. The batter behind the double can't advance a runner with a ground ball. He never leaves second base. The last inning, first and second, nobody out. And the Red Strand, a runner at third. Two and two on Rizzo. Jumbo Diaz, an outstanding eighth inning. Retired the side in order. And now Chapman in the ninth. In the air, left center field, Marlon Byrd nearly overran it and then dropped it. He did overrun it. That ball had so much tail on it going back from left center to left field that Byrd, who has been spectacular defensively in the outfield for the Reds, slightly overran the ball. We got a br great break on the ball. But he looked up. I think he thought that ball was heading towards the gap. But when a left-handed hitter hits the ball to left center, the ball is going to slice back to you as a left fielder. Now Chris Bryant. Ball one. Surely they didn't score that as a double. What's that? They scored that as a double. Yes. That's a not a double. That's a bad decision. One and oh on Bryant. Threw a fastball at a hundred. But Bryant comes up empty. If you're wondering, and I don't think anybody's sitting around here debating whether or not Bryant's going to punt. Phillips is a very different hitter than, and so is Kozart for that matter, than Bryant. Bryant has never had a sacrifice in his very short professional career. Chapman ahead and one ball and two strikes on Bryant. Trying to get him to chase a high fastball. Count even. Now the Cubs have a pinch hitter standing in the on deck circle. That is Wellington Castillo. To the count, runner at second, nobody out, tie game. Ball four. Well, now do you? Well, we were wondering there for a second. You know, you you have guys that certainly have been asked to bunt. Now, bunting Chapman is a whole different world. You have Kristen Norphy in the one time red. You have Jonathan Herrera down there. And they're still going to send up Wellington Castillo. But wouldn't you think, Tom, if Castillo is going to be your batter, he's really not up there to bunt. Otherwise, you would see one of the other two that you mentioned earlier. Although, you know, having said that, 
Castillo did have two sacrifices last year, and those numbers are, you know, I mean, they're exceptional numbers against Chapman. There are very few guys around that are two out of six. All right, so Chapman will have to work out of a tough spot. Two on. Nobody out. Rizzo had been one for ten against Chapman. And even though that was scored a double. He did hit it hard. Oh and two. Center field. Hamilton prepares for the throw. Rizzo will not go anywhere as Hamilton fires a laser granted offline a bit. But Hamilton has an excellent arm. One away in the inning. Starlet Castro. Strike one. There are times when Chapman throws the baseball, it literally looks like it's coming out of the back of his cap. Runners go. How about that? A double steal. Well, if you're not checking the runners and you're only one looking pitch, one look pitch, one look pitch, that's going to happen. When a guy like Rizzo, you know, you talked about that in Chicago last week. I mean, he'll he'll get you every now and again if you don't pay attention to him. That's three out of three for him. Infield in. Chapman ahead of Castro. Nothing at two. It's Rizzo's fourth stolen base. Chris Bryant with his first. Game on the line here in the top of the ninth inning. One, two on Castro. Struck him out swinging. miles an hour about neck high for a hitter you're just looking fastball and hoping that it's down and if it just happens to be neck high you hope you can foul it off didn't happen one more out to go for a roll to Chapman now this guy can hit the fastball now was never a great breaking ball hitter when he caught here in Cincinnati. But I've seen him square up some heaters. One ball to one strike on Ross. He was caught the entire game. A double by Rizzo, a walk to Bryant. 
Fly ball to center by Castillo. They pull off the double steal. The Chapman fans, Castro. Oh, boy. And now tries to get the final out against David Ross. When you're behind the plate with Chapman, you almost have to be one big eye. And it better not blink. Broken bat, Frazier's there, Chapman slams the door. Boy, this guy's something, man. All right, Reds have a chance to win it in the bottom of the ninth. Toyota dealers, proud sponsor of the Cincinnati Reds. Proud of just short of 40,000 here tonight. And a roll to Chapman after the Cubbies put two on with nobody out, retires three in a row. Look what he has done against the Cubs the last 13 times he's faced it. Mercy. He may not give up a run all year. Well, he's going right now. I mean, that was rising to the occasion right there. Indeed. All right, Roscoe now going to stay in there. As he will face right-handed batting Marlon Bird. Bird has had a couple of good at-bats tonight. And a single to right in the second. A double down the left field line. Scored in the fourth. And then flying out to center in the sixth. 3-3 game on a chilly night. It was a beautiful night. It is a beautiful night. We're expecting a lot of rain coming in. And well, hopefully it'll be a while. Cubs have some changes after that last inning. Bryant moves from third to left. Herrera now the new third baseman. Bryant played a little left in spring training this year. Played a lot of left when he was at University of San Diego. They had some soreness in the shoulder. And so they moved him from third to left field as you mentioned. During Cactus League games. It's a major benefit for players now that you can play a position play an alternate alternative position. Yep. Three and two on Marlin. It's also a major benefit for those that manage those types of players. We've seen Todd Frazier do it where he's played third base, played first, played left field. Brian Pena behind the plate over at first. Three two to Marlin.
these two teams know a little something about winning in their final at bat. Take a look at that. Reds have eight wins this year. Five of them in their final at bat. The Cubs have eight wins. Half of them in their final at bat. And the Cubs have one of those four against the Reds. See that big yellow tape on the bat handle of Brian Pena. The thicker the tape, the more back control you have. The thinner the handle, the more whip you have and less back control. David Ross has taken a few of those over the years. Even with all the equipment, all the technology that we have today, catchers, let's just put it bluntly, they take a beating. Yep. I mean, how many times have we seen already this year where a hitter takes a big swing, back comes around and just smokes the catcher either in the back of the helmet, on the hand, on the shoulder. You didn't plan for that when you woke up that morning. Second time Pena's looked at strike three tonight. Two away in the inning. Boy, the Reds are striking out a ton tonight. Fifteen of them. And Ross Cup has struck out every batter he's faced. Bruce to end the eighth. Bird and Pena to begin the ninth. And now Koza. This was a guy in Roscoe that we saw a little bit last year. He did not make their opening day roster this season. They brought him up when the Reds were in Chicago last week. Side two down, nobody on. Bottom of the ninth. And there's a strike. Christopher Dane Grove stands in the on deck circle. Now, if you're Cozart here, 3 1 pitch, you've just seen that fastball right down the heart of the plate. You got to sell out for that pitch here. Out there, one, two, three, go the Reds. We're on our way to the tenth. The next training, the Reds are one and two. Cubs are two and zero. Oh.
Reds had a pair of leads in this one. Well, hold on a minute now. We're going to the 10th inning. Aroldis Chapman came out to warm up. That was nothing more than to give J.J. Hoover a little extra time to get loose in the bullpen. That's when Brian Price went to the mound and made the pitching change. So he'll bring in J.J. Hoover. And Joe Madden will immediately counter with the final player left on his bench. They burned to Norfia without him ever coming to the plate or in the field. And it will be Miguel Montero. 3-3 game here in the 10th inning. So that move had much less to do with allowing Hoover longer time to get loose and much more to do with Brian Price wanting to make sure that the last bench player on the Cubs dugout is now at the play. But of course you always ask yourself the question which matchup would you rather have. If you're the Cubs or the Reds do you like Denorfia's chances better against Chapman. Or do you like Montero's chances better against Hoover? Well, I, I don't. I don't think that's the question here. I, th I think the, quite the the issue is that Brian Price had no intent of leaving Chapman in for a second inning. I got you. Okay. Swing and a miss. Yeah, he had a lengthy one inning. You know, we, we saw him in spring training go a couple of innings uh, a number of times to stretch him out and get him ready, but that was a long ninth inning for Chapman. Three and two on Montero. Struck him out. Swung a ball four. Chased a high fastball indeed. So JJ takes care of business one away. High riding heater up and out of the zone and Montero. Sitting on that bench a while. That one probably looked real nice until he decided to swing. Breaking ball to Addison Russell, low and away, ball one. Russell was struck out three times tonight. Reds have stayed predominantly down and away from Russell, right on the outside corner.
Now the ball game that Hoover pitched the other day in Milwaukee, he was really flying Oprah on the front side. And that's what Brian Pena was reminding him of right there. Don't start that again. That's when Hoover walked three batters. And then was charged with all three runs when Badenhop came into the game behind him and allowed a grand slam to Elian Herrera. Two and two to Russell. Now we are in the part of the Reds bullpen where Brian Price is looking for somebody, anybody, step everybody. Up. Somebody to step up. To step up. Pretty that's close right there, three and two. That's been a strike the entire night. For both sides. It's a little bit off the plate. You see where it is? Blew him away on high gas at 95. Wow. Two up, two down for Hoover. And now it's Dexter Fowler, one of four. Big looping breaking ball drops in there, strike one. Pirates have jumped on Arizona, three nothing. That game at the bottom of the second inning in Phoenix. Same score, St. Louis over Milwaukee. Bottom seven at Miller Park. Jam shot pop up. That is an outstanding tenth for Hoover. Reds will have a pinch hitter. Hamilton and Vado coming up in a three-three game. In the opening game of this three game series, a Reds and a Cubs. J.J. Hoover, a 1 2 3 top of the 10th in powerful fashion. And now his team will try and win it in the bottom of the 10th. Schumacher will bat for Hoover. Jason Mott, former Cardinal closer, takes over on the mound. Be the ninth game for Mott. You see the ERA quite high. Seven hits in eight innings. He's allowed five runs and a home run to boot. These two guys, former teammates. Mott and Schumacher back in the Cardinal day. Ross Cup perfect out of the Cup bullpen. 
One and a third struck out three of the four he faced. His cup bullpen has been very good this year. Although Mott's last time out, he got knocked around a little bit. Little bleeder. This is gonna fall. Sometimes you have to take a little break like that where you get jammed on a ball and it falls in for a hit and make it hurt. Well now we have seen two situations where the Reds did not bunt. You have a leadoff hitter in Billy Hamilton who this year does not have a sacrifice and You know if you successfully bunt here that Votto will be walked. So the decision again for Brian Price the third time he's had to make this call in the last four innings. In this position this is a no brainer bunt. You know, we have talked about it in the early part of this year, and, and you just hope that it's something that's going to change. But Hamilton has not bunted well this year, meaning this spring and in this regular season. They spent a lot of time in the winter with the line of the shields. Among other things, they worked on bunting. That one's perfect. Can't do any better now. And Hamilton nearly beat it out. So Billy the sacrifice putting the winning run in scoring position. Here comes Votto. And already the four fingers put up by Joe Madden. There is no way they're going to let Votto beat them in the 10th inning. I think as the season goes along, especially if Votto continues on the kind of tear that he's been on here early in the season, the more times Hamilton gets aboard and steals second base, we're going to see this. And it's going to be up to the guy that's standing in the on deck circle, whether that be Todd Frazier or whoever it may be. On opening day, it was Frazier who delivered the three run home run off Tony Watson to snap a 2 2 tie. Frazier had the double, which set up the winning run to sweep the Pirates in the bottom of the ninth inning. He had the sack fly to beat. The Cardinals that first game of the series here. So he's been in some big spots already here at home, especially. Well, the thing that you have to do if you're going to hit behind a hitter like Votto, you have to relish these types of situations. You have to want to be in this before the game ever starts. Please put me in this pressure spot at the end of the ball game. Because if you're not expecting it, you will be surprised by it and you will not perform well. well it's it's just like coming out of that bullpen. If you don't want to be in there with the bases loaded, you ain't going to cut it. You know, we were walking through some of the big hits Frazier had in that first home stand of the year. Every game, he also had the two run single. You may remember against the Cardinals, it gave him a lead. Swing and a miss. That was a game the Reds let get away on that Sunday to drop the series finale. Winning run at second, nothing in one on Frazier. Good night tonight for Todd. A double, a walk, struck out, had an infield hit in the eighth.
This will be the second out of the inning. Phillips was in in the eighth inning. Which that was two on and nobody out. And he bounced into a double play when they elected not to have Phillips bunt. But they go ahead running second and nobody out. Now the winning run in second. Two out. Phillips bounced into a double play in that eighth inning. Last cup would come on from the bullpen to strike out Jay Bruce. Sending us to the ninth and here we are in the tenth. One oh one Brandon. Started to pull the trigger and laid off. Boy Mott is rushing it up there now. It's come all the way back from Tommy John surgery. The only man that matters. He's a winning run. Not thought he had strike two there. And we saw that spot for J.J. Hoover earlier. It was a strike early in the game. Late in the game, things change. Four and they're loaded for Bruce. Bruce is 0 for 4, has struck out three times. He had Votto in third in the eighth inning with a chance to give the Reds a lead, and Roscoe struck him out. This is his first at bat of the game against a right handed pitcher. And he's done a lot of that tonight. Two strikes on Bruce. Schumacher, the winning run, stands at third with two away here in the last of the tenth inning. Majority of which are still here. Hoping Bruce can send them home celebrating with a base hit here in the 10th. Still two and two. Wide 
open on the left side of the infield. They are praying Bruce to pull. Castro behind. Votto at second. The Lone Ranger over there, Herrera, kind of in between in no man's land between short and third base spot. We go to the 11th. Reds leave them loaded. We're tied at three. Chubbo Diaz. The one, two, three inning. Chapman got into trouble in the ninth. But with runners in second and third in a tie game, he fanned Castro, got Ross on a broken bat pop up. And then J.J. Hoover in the tenth inning. Well, he came in throwing gas tonight. One, two, three, two strikeouts. I think with any bullpen, the longer the game goes on that you don't score and it remains tied, the more susceptible you become, whether that be the Cubs, the Reds, or any bullpen. Well, the Reds are going to bring on Burke Badenhop, who, like Kevin Gregg and like Manny Parra, and at times like Jumbo and Hoover, they've all struggled. But again, Brian Price is hoping guys can begin to step up. And so far tonight, Diaz and Hoover have stepped up. Throw the ball well. Cubs have the heart of their lineup here in the 11th inning. Soler, Rizzo, Bryant. Takes care of Soler, one away. I'm not sure what Soler was looking for there, but that baby was right down Broadway, belt high. They've been looking for a cab. Well, now Rizzo. Boy, he has stepped it up when his team has needed him most here late. If the two run home run to tie the game way back in the fourth inning, walked in the sixth, and in the ninth, was given credit for a double on a ball he laced in a left center field. Marlon Bird overran the ball. It hit off of his glove as he tried to reach back across his body. And Rizzo with a double. Hamilton. 
Reynolds in a diving attempt. He did not get it. He better get up and throw it into second base. And it's a single by Rizzo. We can see that all the way up here. Great effort by Hamilton. As you could tell as that ball came off the bat, it had some serious top spin. At that point for Hamilton, you just got to make sure it doesn't get by you. That's how you do it if you're an outfielder, though. Even if it's short hops, you snap that glove into the air as though you caught it. So there's Rizzo again. I mean, he's right in the middle of it all. Four straight time he's reached base. And now Bryant. One of three. And there's Troy. He had a blue single to left field in the sixth. Walked, stole a base. In the ninth. The Reds have had multiple chances to break this tie after the game was tied in the seventh inning on a home run by Cogman. That was against Lee to tie the game where we are now at three. Reds in the bottom of the seventh had a leadoff double. The runner never advanced. They had first and second and nobody out to begin the eighth. But a double play and a strikeout ended that. They had a runner in second with one out in the tenth and left them loaded. Really the only scoring chance for the Cubs since a game tying home run was against Chapman ironically enough in the ninth inning second and third one out and a has gotten down the business. A switch hitter. Go ahead, run for the Cubs at second base with. One away here in the 11th inning, and Herrera down a strike. Had got a piece of Pena, and he's hurting a little bit. It's like a little from Joe Frazier to the chin. See by the reaction of Herrera there, he was looking for that same fastball. Hips open, hands started to come forward. He had no choice but to stop. Came back with it again, and it's fouled out of play. with Castro standing on deck. Well, that has always been Maiden Hop's MO, a ground ball pitcher. 
inducing double play balls. So perhaps he can dial one up right here and right now and send the Reds to the plate in the last of the 11. Two and two. Reds will have Bird, Pena, Kozoy. And they bat in the bottom of the 11th. They're hoping to be hitting in a 3 3 game. That's up to Baden Hop. He's allowed a pair of one out hits to Rizzo and Bryant. Pull the string on him again, but Herrera able to make contact. It's interesting you have a in a career of Herrera where he hits unbelievably higher in extra innings than he does in regular at bats. It's quite a battle here. You wonder if that's a concentration factor. Because when you're in extra innings and you're hitting in this situation, every pitch is do or die. There are no giveaways right now. They sit in the right field. They're going to wave around Rizzo. And he will score. Throw to second. Safe there. Well, Herrera never broke stride. As soon as that ball started to come in, he kept right on rolling. Three straight hits. And that went right down the middle of the plate. Herrera wasn't going to miss it. Actually, Walt Castro, you know, the Reds bullpen. And look, these are just statistical facts. In the 16 games in which the Reds bullpen has pitched this season, they have allowed at least one run in 12 of the 16 games. And of course, Aroldis Chapman has not allowed a single run. And for all intents and purposes, Tony Singrani has not been seen nor heard from in really seemingly forever. It's been about 10 or 11 days since he threw. Now he's been up a couple of times. The last time he pitched was against the Cubs. On Tuesday, the 14th, In and Chicago. that was for one third of an inning. And there are a lot of guys that have pitched multiple times since Tony got in a ball game. And this was a guy that was supposed to be one of your starting five. So it's not as though he doesn't have the stuff to compete. First question comes to mind is something wrong with Singrani or is he just falling out of favor? So now David Ross with the base is loaded. And this ball is killed in the right center field. Two more runs will score on a double by David Ross. You know, we can sit here and talk about bullpen from now until the end of time. But the bottom line is the Reds had a lot of chances to win this game. 
before the 11th inning. Well, that's what I was saying earlier. The, the deeper that you go in any bullpen in extra innings, the more you become susceptible. You're putting your best guys out there first. And you start getting to the 9th, 10th, and 11th man on your staff. The chances of the opposition putting runs on the board become greater. Travis Wood looks like he's going to step in and hit. Yeah, they're out of uh, position players as we brought up earlier. So he is batting for the pitcher Mott, who right now is a pitcher of record despite allowing a hit and walking two batters. But he gets the big out when he needed it. He got Frazier with two on and one out, and he got Bruce with the bases loaded. Broken bat will not get a run. And that makes it seven to three. That almost went further than the ball did. But it did carry him off the glove of the pitcher Badenhock. The top two relievers in the Cubs bullpen have not been used in this game tonight. Stroke and their closer Rondon. Although he is getting loose now, even though with that last run, it's no longer a safe situation. base runners four hits Herrera broke the tie with a single and after an intentional walk David Ross with a two run double to right center field well it's had leads in this one of two nothing and three to two as late as the seventh when Coglin homered off leak to tie the game. But the Reds got outstanding bullpen work tonight from Diaz, Chapman, and Hoover and had chances in the seventh, the eighth, and the tenth and could not get the big hit. And this will end a four run 11th. Reds have work to do. They trail seven to three.
Tom Browning and reliving the moment so many of us remember that was not the 1990 season. But when he sat up on one of the rooftops out on Sheffield Avenue down the right field line at Wrigley Field. Of course, Tom hanging with all his buddies from that 1990 World Series championship team. And they will be honored. We'll have all of the coverage for you after the game tonight. Then again tomorrow at noon as Rondon takes over on the mound. And as you mentioned, Tom, this is not a safe situation, but manager Drill Madden had him up getting hot. Might as well bring him on in. Things off. Bird two out of four. He had a single in the second inning and had a double scored in one of the fourth. Two balls and two strikes on Marlon Bird. To the right side, and Russell will throw out Bird. One away. in this game tonight we talk about you know that the one thing a lot of people will focus on is the way things went for Baden Hop in the in the 11th inning and rightfully so uh, you know they brought Baden Hop in here as a free agent and so far it has not gone well at all but it would be interesting to know the last time a baseball team won a game when they were 0 for 14 with runners in scoring position I don't know when the last time that happened Maybe it's happened a lot. But the Reds are 0 for 14 tonight with the runners in scoring position. And Lord knows in the 7th, 8th, and 10th innings, all they needed was one hit from one guy. And they would have never seen the 11th inning. Three and 0 to paint. And he'll take the one out one. Oh, Payne, you can't believe it. Let's take a look. That would be a ball. Tonight is one of the uh, reasons it makes baseball such a great game. A bummer if your team loses. But you look back on so many decisions, and it's not looking back as in second guessing, because, you know, we just threw out the options there as this game was rolling along right when the time happened for both teams. The question that came up a lot tonight to bunt or not to bunt as that's a second out and the Reds are down to their final out of the game. And those are the questions that will be asked of Brian Price undoubtedly at the end of this game. I think as a manager you you're trying to find out exactly all right, who's going to be able to to come through in this situation, whether they're in the four spot, whether they're in the eight spot, whatever that may be.
And if they don't get it done, well, then from now on you put the bun on. Yep. And nobody has anything to say about that. Those are behind 0 and 2. Nine hits for Chicago. Three runs, eight hits for the Reds. 7 3, the final 11. Our steel power tool performer. In the 11th inning, two on, tie game. Herrera bangs one into right field. The game winning hit for Jonathan Herrera. Cubs tacked on three more there in the 11th inning. So don't forget, high noon tomorrow. Our coverage begins as we honor the 1990 World Series champion Reds on the field with a big ceremony. And they'll all be introduced tonight on Reds Live, which is coming up next. We'll look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Stick around for Reds Live.